privilege to worship together. Eh? Oh my word, that was amazing. Thank you to the worship team. Let's give them some appreciation. <clears throat> I know they don't do it for us, but they do serve us, and that's great. Eh? Oh. Right, so we're in, um, we're in this um, series of going through the book of Philippians, and we're into chapter 4, the last chapter, and so a little bit of a summary of things. We've called it point of view, POV, um, and um, it's, it's Paul's point of view that he wants uh, the, the church in Philippi to understand. And we saw in chapter 1, we saw, he said we must live for the gospel. He said we must, we must have strong, we must build strong gospel partnerships. And we must live in a way that our, that our life is worthy of the gospel. We saw some of the things in chapter 2, that we must follow Christ's example of humility. We must do everything without grumbling or disputing. And we must... Uh, we, and in that way, we distinct and different from the world. And uh, we must also serve one another like Timothy and Epaphras. And then uh, last week in chapter 3, um, um, it, some of the things that came out is we will be a people of faith and not works. And we are saved by faith through the grace of God, which is a gift, not earned by our good works and deeds. And we must also keep pressing towards the goal of knowing Christ. And those are some of the things that came through. And so today we're going to go in chapter 4. And the first verse starts like this. Chapter 4 verse 1 says, Therefore, my brothers. And so he's obviously referring to something that he's just said. So I want to just uh, read Philippians 3 verse 17 to 21 because just so that when we launch in to his therefore, we know what he's just said, and therefore he's going to carry on speaking. Is that okay? Right. 17. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have, you have in us. For many of whom have often, so sorry, for many of whom I have often told you and I'm now telling you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, and their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame, with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables him even to, even to subject all things to himself. And then it says, therefore, and he goes in. So he's talking about, he's reminding us that we live in a certain way. We, uh, he's reminding us that we can walk as enemies of the cross, but we don't do that because we're citizens of another, of, uh, of heaven. And uh, so let's jump straight in there. But what I want to do is, as I go through this, there's so much that Paul uh, the Word of God is an incredibly powerful and rich and full. And so I know that as I read God's Word and unpack it a little bit, your hearts are going to be touched. And so can I ask that as God speaks to you, you respond, because I'm not going to do it at the end. We're building a culture of people who are quick to receive and obey. And so if God speaks to you, if you have to, you can raise your hand, you can say amen, you can stand and sit down, whatever. It's good to do a physical thing, but I'm not saying you have to, but it's good to do that for you, for you. acknowledging that actually God's talking, right? So is that okay? Verse 1, greetings. The first thing is a greeting. He says, therefore, my brothers, whom I love... And long for my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I love this right at the start. It's like a little guideline to mature relationships. I love 
whom you love and long for. How many of you know you can love people but not want to be with them? Everyone puts their hand up. <laughs> okay? But a guideline to mature relationships, he says, I love, I love you guys and I long to be with you. All right? That's mature relationships. So right, up, right out, the, out, the, out the starting blocks, this is what he's saying. So I love that. There's two phrases. I love and long to be with my joy and my crown. And it's the same with my joy and my crown. My joy, you give me joy. And you are my crown. A crown is a, to signify victory and accomplishment. You put a crown on the victor. All right? So who, your children, when they're born, they've done nothing. They bring you joy. If you've, if you've had children, and if you haven't, just trust me. They're just born, and they give you joy. All right? But after some time, when they've done some things, then you're proud of them. Okay? Maturity. All right? And so I think this, right at the start, he says, I, 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 I both, I love you, and I want to be with you. You bring me joy, and I'm proud of you. That's, how, how, how are your relationships doing? Your family, with your parents, your siblings, your colleagues. This is mature. This is a little gauge. Little. Okay. Happy? God speaking? Any? Oh, no one. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Stand firm, therefore, in the Lord, because because I love you. You bring me joy. All of these things. Stand firm, therefore, in the Lord. Hold your ground. Maintain your position. In light of what he's just said, stand firm. The second thing is, he's talking about agreeing in the Lord. This is a, um, a great passage because there was a disagreement between these two ladies. I'll read verse 2 and 3. Eurodia and Sintich. Sintichi. So I'm going to just call her Suntachi. Okay? <laughs> I got that from Rory Dyer. I thought it was brilliant. She's very touchy. She gets touchy soon. So we're going to call it soon touchy. So you, there might be some soon touchies here. Not in that way. <laughs> okay, let's go. I entreat you, Erodia, and I entreat you, soon touchy, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers, those whose names are in the book of life. Beautiful passage this. It's interesting. So he's addressing a disagreement where there's been a disagreement about two people in this church. And he says, Paul makes an individual appeal to each of them. So we stand together in things of unity, but we are individually responsible. All right? You have an argument or a, or a disagreement or something with somebody, you'll be held accountable yourself, although it affects us all. <laughs> and he says, it's interesting to me, he doesn't debate on the cause of the disagreement. He just says, agree in the Lord. All right, why? Why does it, does it mean, is he saying, just come to a compromise? No, he's not saying come to a compromise. He's saying, in Christ, there, there's a hierarchy of things. And some things are more important than other things. And the, one of the things that's more important than your own opinion is our unity. <laughs> and so he says, agree in the Lord because of the name of the Lord. Because what do we represent? We represent Him. And sometimes our personal stuff, we put it aside and make it less important for the sake of the bigger thing. And that's what he's saying here. He's not saying compromise. He's not saying like you're wrong. He's saying agree in the Lord. He doesn't ask, and then this beautiful phrase, he, he addresses somebody else, the person he's possibly writing to, um, and he says, let me read it, he says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, that's the word I want to bring in, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side. So there's, there's people like uh, Clement and the rest of the fellow workers and this true companion, 
So there's a whole lot of people who worked with Eurodia and Suntachi. They had, a, they had an argy-bargy. They didn't agree, right? And he chooses the true companion because he knows the true companion... <laughs> Stop laughing, Sim. You're going to distract me. <laughs> he, there's, a whole, there's a whole lot of um, people working, co-workers together. But the one person is the true companion that is able to get through to Eurodia and Suntachi. All right? And so my question is, who is your true companion? Who are you going to hear the voice of sense with? Who's going to take you from your high ground and say, actually, there's more important things. Who, do you have a true companion? And it, if you're married, it should be one of your true companions should be your spouse. But you, here's what happens in life. We have things that happen, and then we blow up. We make a big scene or make it hard for people to be a true companion to us and come and say, you know what, darling, my dear, <laughs> you were wrong then. <laughs> you shouldn't have said it like you said it. Stuff happens and then we stop being a true companion in our, our spouse relationship. And I want to say to you in the name of the Lord this morning, because what happens when we stop, in other words, Lee comes to me and I blow up and I make it hard for her to be a true companion because of my, how I handle myself. Maybe it's my insecurities. Maybe I think I'm always right. Maybe I think she's only a woman. That was a joke. <laughs> and I make it hard for anybody to correct me. What happens from then on going forward, this relationship becomes dysfunctional because there's no freedom anymore because now that's a no-go area. And I want to say in Jesus' name, if you're, mar you're, 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 if you, if you're married, spouses are supposed to be the true companion, the one who helps you see the voice of reason, the one who helps you see what you're blind to see. And in the name of Jesus, please, Repent right now if you're the one who's made it hard for your spouse or if you're the one who's just stopped talking and saying, actually, that's not okay. You can all stand now because the Lord's talking to you all. <laughs> right, true companion. I've got a whole lot of tips for disagreement, but we'll just skip over that. All right, verse 4 and verse 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So he commands us to rejoice. Interesting, eh? It's a command. I read the, in the Greek, it's clearly a command. It's not a choice. Rejoice in the... So he's saying choose joy. All right? Or grumble. Choose gr joy or be unreasonable. By agreeing in the Lord. And then let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What are you known for? Reasonableness? Argumentative? Always right? <laughs> let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What is your reputation? Why is your reputation? Why do people know you like that? Deal with it if it's not supposed to be something that should be supposed to be in it. Because he says, be known for your reasonableness. Right. Verse 6 and 7. He says, don't worry, pray. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Choose peace. And either choose worry or peace. How are you doing? How are you doing? Are you choosing worry or are you choosing peace? It's a choice. Stop it. Verse 8 and 9. He 
he talks about how we are to choose what we think. So he says, choose joy, choose peace over worry. And now he says, choose what you think. Verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the Lord of peace will be with you. So he says, choose what you think. Don't allow allow life to make you think what you know is not going to help you. So choose your joy, choose peace over worry and choose how you think. And then the interesting little phrase at the end in verse 7, it says, it say, he says, um, oh, sorry, verse 9. What you have learnt and received and heard and seen in me. There's a whole process there. We learn, we receive, we hear, we see, and then we put it in practice. Now, we have, all of us are great with our intentions, but practice is the measure of what we actually the outcome is who you are is what you practice. Right? So my question is, what, which part of these steps are you falling off the bus? We learn, we receive, we hear, we see, and then we practice. God talking to anyone? Moving on. Verse 10. Now he moves to talking about God's incredible provision. Verse 10 says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. That now at length you uh, now at length you have revived your concern for me. You indeed uh, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I, I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in every circ- in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. God's provision. It's incredible to me here because He says that He's been, he's been hungry and He's had plenty, but He's been content through it all. I guarantee... If you don't have food for a week, a whole week, you just don't have because you don't have. Most of us would not be content. We'd be pulling out all kinds of things that what we deserve and what God owes us because we are children of God. Paul's not like that. He's actually okay without, he says he's hungry in hunger and in plenty. So what is behind, how is he thinking that having nothing is, a, is okay for him? How, how, how did he get there? You gotta, we gotta, we've got to unpack. How is he thinking that when he's got nothing, he's not blaming God, saying God, like naming it and claiming it, and it's like it's my right, I'm a child of God to eat, etc., etc. How, how is that his attitude? What thinking does he have? See, in Paul's doctrine, in his thinking, whether he's got plenty or he's in hunger, whatever his circumstance, it's not affecting his joy, his identity, his standing in God, or whether or how he thinks. Most of us, if we're doing well, we think we have the blessing of God. And God favors us. And if we're doing badly, if we are, have some lack in our life and we, we're struggling, um, let's talk financially. If we're struggling financially, we think like we've done something wrong and now that's the, God's punishing us. I want to say that's very unbiblical thinking. It's not good doctrine. If you've flip into either one of those and think like, actually, 
I'm styling. My bank account's flush. And then you feel like you're doing okay. God loves you more. <laughs> Paul says, regardless of my bank account, regardless of my circumstance, regardless of whether I'm struggling or not, regardless of whether I'm going through a struggle or a hard time, I'm in jail, I'm in prison or not. He's got his eyes on God. He understands that God loves him regardless of his circumstance. And he doesn't have to not be in trouble and going through troubles and hardship and a struggle for God to love him. Interesting, eh? And that's interesting, he, he, he pivots from God supply to financial partnership now. Um, I'm not saying there's a connection, but it's interesting that he does that. There may be a connection to his understanding of God supplying his need to his to financial partnership giving. Verse 14. Very silent now. We don't talk about finances. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. As you Philippians yourselves know, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even, the, even in Thessalonica, you sent, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek a gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory um, in Christ Jesus. So Paul talks here plainly about finances and and and. and Gospel partnership. So there's a, when you talk about tithing and financial giving, there's generally two little escape clauses that people use. All right? The first one is tithing is Old Testament. Or tithing is part of the law. That's the first escape clause people love. Now just to unbungle that, as we see Abraham tithed, when did the law come with? Moses, right? Moses was the law, and we know that Abraham was before the law. Right? So what happened is Ab Abraham won a battle, and he became very wealthy. And he received money from the, from the battle, and he wanted to honor God. He wanted everyone to know that actually it's God who has made me, made me wealthy. And, he, and he's, that's where tithing starts. So tithing was never about the law. Tithing was always about uh, giving, and tithing was always about one's heart towards God. It's never been about the law, because it was before the law. And during the time of the law, the Israelites said, hey, um, just tell us what to do, and we'll do it. We'll be righteous. And so God gave them laws to, do, to prove to them, in a sense, that they actually couldn't do it. All right? So he said, 10% you're going to give, and there were other ways of giving. Now, Jesus came and fulfilled the law. So now we're in the new covenant. So how should we give? Because remember, tithing, the law was just like, this is a guideline, get going. All right? But the heart is actually, I want to honor God, that everything I have is God's, and I want everyone to know that I'm His the way I handle my money. And so it's always a hard thing towards God. But we know that the Bible also says the promises of the, of the new covenant are greater and better. So in, in our giving, we should surpass the law because it was just the starting blocks of giving. No, not an amen in the house. I guarantee you, everyone who has a problem with tithing gives less than 10%. Guarantee you. Guarantee you. And they're not even hitting the mark Old Testament standard-wise. Never mind, we are in a new covenant that has greater promises, greater blessings, far greater, and so our hearts should be fuller and greater, and our giving should be more to God. 
because we honor Him more because He's done even more for us. Happy? <clears throat> and he ends off that little, verse 19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory <coughs> in Christ Jesus. How many of you have claimed that verse? It's a trap. I'm just telling you up here. The context, what's the context of that, of that passage? Apostolic giving. Alright? So don't claim that verse if you're not giving apostolically. You know what apostolic giving is? Four givings. Tithing, offering, looking after your family responsibility, giving to the poor, apostolic giving. Five types of giving in Scripture. That's the context. My God will supply everything you need. That's what he said to them. The ones that were the ones that looked after him. Happy days? Anyone challenged? Final greeting. Three more verses. Uh, verse 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those in the house, in Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It's interesting that he's writing from Rome, writing to Philippi, and it's like the church here is greeting the church there. It's amazing. Um, everyone, he says, all the brothers who are with me, so he was obviously with guys a lot when, while he was writing this letter, but also all the saints greet you. And uh, I want to end off with this, verse 23, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul, you remember when we started this in chapter 1 verse 2, he, used, he said grace to you. And then the last, right at the end, he finishes this, this book, uh, 4 verse 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with you. So what is Paul's point of view? His point of view is what do you need? You need more grace. You need more grace to abound to you. We're saved by grace, and it's by His grace and the work of salvation that we are made anew. Um, but He says, now you're, you, what do you need? You need an abundance of grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. And He highlights that, be with your spirit. It's the spirit part of us that relates to God, that connects to God, that communes to God. And so He highlights that no matter whether you're in jail no matter if you're going through hardship, no matter if you're going through suffering, nothing can stop the flow of grace to you to empower you, strengthen you, and make you strong for life and to live the life God's called you to do. That's Paul's final op is opening with grace and is closing with grace in, in this book. I think it's, it's beautiful. Amen. Hasn't it have been a great series? Has, has God's word ministered to you, despite me and the others who have preached? Amen. Let's stand. Can I have the band here? Let's just keep our, heart, our hearts open. I really meant what, what, what I said in the, in the beginning. Just allow God and respond as God's word touches your heart. Say, yes, Lord, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that. See, God's word is like our blueprint. And when we see something in the word and it doesn't line up with what we, how we're living, then we make the adjustment immediately. That's how we learn we observe, we see, and then we act. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for reminding us that you're an eternal, all-powerful, wonderful, God eternal, as we worshipped you. And thank you for your word now, Lord God. You've encouraged us. And even this last verse that we read reminds us that we have grace of God. And Lord, by your grace, would you come and minister 
empower your people to be everything that we need to be. Would you help us in our relationships? Would you help us in our finances? Would you help us in our homes? Would you help us in our marriages? Would you empower us more and more? Because you are worth it. You are glorious and you are good God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.